Our next interview is with Robert Fraker, uh, who is from Lanesboro, Mass, the western part of the state. And Bob, could you just give us like a little thumbnail bio of you, uh, background, family, mm -hmm. uh, how you got into the trade, what turned you on about the book business, and just ramble on for a couple of minutes. Okay. Um, I uh, grew up in Westchester, uh, in White Plains, North White Plains, New York, and uh, uh, when I went to college, I became an English major, and uh, very happily so. Um, and my introduction to the book trade, I, I always point to a course in 18th century English literature that I took. Uh, it was required. I did not expect to enjoy the dry neoclassical poets. Um, and it was taught by a wonderful woman named uh, Rosemary Cowler. And, and the nice part about the course was that she taught it um, in her, her living room. Oh. And she taught it from uh, 18th century folios of Pope and Dryden. Wow. Um, and she passed them around. And that was my first introduction to the idea that wow. you could actually have books from that period mm. of the people that you love. And she was passionate about these people, and she had a wonderful library of 18th century literature. And, uh, and then I uh, worked um, in New York City during the summers. My father was employed there, and I worked in his office uh, for the summers. And it was around the corner from Maurice Inman's <laughs> shop. Yes. And, uh, and I used to spend my lunch hours there. And I would buy, um, I was uh, very fond of Dickens. I would buy those bound volumes, 15 bucks. You know, certainly uh, things I could afford. And uh, it would be the first book editions of this or that Dickens novel. And then somehow I got on, uh, this is just to show how I was aware that there was a trade. Uh, uh, somehow I got on Steve Weissman's early Zimmons. list. Uh, yeah. Zimini's uh, his nice little, um, yeah. those compact little quartos, lists. compact lists, and uh, and I would read them, and not buy, but uh, I would read them, and uh, then when I got out of college, I uh, moved to New York, and became a film film librarian for a company that uh, ran, you know, pre-video days, you would rent 16 millimeter prints of the classic films, and this was one of those classic film oh. libraries. And I wrote the catalogs for them, um, reflecting my interest in film at the time, and, uh, and then headed the library, that, uh, the rental. Um, then my f my, uh, we were living in, well, first in Manhattan and then in Brooklyn, and I moved. We moved out of sit the city when my son was, first child was born. And we moved up to, from Brooklyn to Savoy, Massachusetts, population yes. 300. <laughs> and that's a whole other story that we don't want to hear. But um, in, inspired by, uh, in the meantime, I had taken trips to oh, Alpen books and um, uh, other uh, sort of country book places um, and bought things here and there. And I was aware when I as the, uh, the English major syndrome when I was not immediately employable in uh, <laughs> uh, northern Berkshire County. Uh, I saw I, Roger Harris's New England, Indiana, if you remember that shop. Oh, yes, and, um, vividly. You know, and he used to send out those wonderful mimeographed, purple inked mimeographed yeah, yes. lists with every margin uh, crammed with two and three dollar books. Yeah. And, um, and I thought to myself, if he can do this in North Adams, if he can carry on, he just seemed to have a thriving business. People would come. He'd tell, I'd meet ca dealers from California in his shop and all this stuff. So I figured if, uh, maybe I'll give it a shot. So I just took a deep breath, put an ad in the paper, and said, I buy old books. Huh. And uh, I bought rooms full of junk. Um, that's the education I had, um, is how, what books not to buy yeah. uh, for a while. But from these rooms full, I would get enough things that with some instinct from by being an English major and being aware of scholarship and, um, and interested in quirky subjects that there maybe this book would sell. Um, so I m sent out my first list in um, 1971 and took the name from the town, Savoy Books, but it was sort of one of those generic terms like Acme, you know. I yeah, figured yeah. even if I moved out of Savoy, I you you know, still use, use, use Savoy. So I became Savoy Books, and we had uh, we lived on a property, large property with a long carriage shed, and I set that up as um, 
sort of a destination rural bookstore. And uh, I also put it, took a little ad in the Times Magazine saying, uh, you know, used books uh, for sale, lists published. <laughs> and um, to my amazement, I got responses from people and I started selling books. And, uh, and, it, um, and it just sort of immediately started working. And, uh, and then I uh, was fortunate to fall into this good, well, it's the first people I uh, got visits from, as long as we're documenting this period of the trade. Uh, uh, Matthew and Cheryl Needle showed up, of with, course, with baby Hannah on her on, on her back, yeah. um, and I sold. Uh, as I remember, so for thirty-five dollars, shockingly high, exciting price, <laughs> an oblong folio of color plates of Vienna from about eighteen twenty. Okay. So <laughs> Okay. All right, so he came back. He kept dollars. coming back. You yes, know. of course. He kept coming back. <laughs> and, uh, and then uh, Howard Mott and uh, Rusty and George Minkoff made a visit. Um, and that was, um, there was a big shift there because uh, getting to know Howard um, and his cataloging style um, and his gentlemanly ad um, ways in the trade uh, became a sort of paradigm for me. I mean, it, was, it was a model. Um, and, you know, I didn't know you could sell a book because it had the first use of the dollar sign, you know, and those kind <laughs> you remember those days, you know, when you, and, yeah. and that there were angles to be worked on yeah. books, and you would s find these books, and even if you didn't know anything where, you would read them and, and determine there was something in here that made it appropriate to this or that collection or this enthusiasm or whatever. So that was a, that was a big shift. I, you know, I went from just, you know, having books on shelves and a, to, um, <laughs> and that, it, I eventually, after having the, um, the book barn, the lists were good. The book barn, um, you know, you had to, you, were you ever in Savoy? Um, no. Uh, well, anyway, no, I, I you can't get there, from, you you can't get there from here, and you certainly can't get there from here in the winter. Yeah. Um, and uh, so I quickly decided I would rather sell one $100 book than $52 books. And that was uh, also a shift. And uh, That's a monumental decision. Yeah. yeah. When you think about it. Um, and it was the days of the uh, Park Burnett shelf sales. Oh, um, and I would go down there regularly. I would go to Swan all the time and, um, and just come home with things that if I didn't know about them, I'd spend time finding out about them. And, uh, and all my trade education has been, um, I mean, it's at, at, at that time, it has been just finding out what to sell and what not to sell, what sells why this book is interesting. Uh, then um, um, I was very enthusiastic living in Savoy in a rural area. I had a large garden. and um, uh, So I decided I would um, specialize in horticulture, agriculture, um, and because uh, nobody seemed to be doing it at the time. Uh, American agriculture books, uh, some people thought you couldn't give them away. And yet I knew that the Founding Fathers, that was their crucial focus, and yes. that was going to be the future of the country. So how come nobody was paying attention to the literature that they read? So I, I decided, here's, here's the books Good are cheap. Niche. The books are cheap. Uh, nobody's codified them in any way. Um, and I can find out which ones are the rare ones, which ones are the important ones. And, and so I, um, that's how I decided. Um, the the tab agriculture and horticulture. Yeah. And then, uh, yeah, and the horticultural books. Uh, uh, but I, I could never not um, be a, a generalist in many ways because there are just too many interesting books out there. So, um, you know, when I'd come home from, I'd go to the shelf sales and I'd just say, oh, that's interesting, that's interesting. And <laughs> come home with, you know, these, you know. Boxes full of books. Boxes and boxes full of books that were really great books. I mean, um, I remember the time I found uh, you know, Teddy Roosevelt's little single sh Listing, sheet listing of uh, the birds of Long Island, his first publication. Wow. You know, um, I found a, um, here, here's a good Howard Mott story. He, uh, I found in a box lot a, 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 pencil, uh, a German uh, Ben Franklin, a single issue of a, a Ben Franklin newspaper in German. Um, I thought, well, that's interesting enough, Ben Franklin. So I put, you know, um, I think it was $275 on it. Howard Mott came found it. I like that, he said, and took it. Um, and 
a month later, I got a check in the mail saying, well, we, let, we did our research, so that's the only surviving copy of that thing, and we got a lot of money for it, and here's your part of it. And he's, he sent me a check back. Um, so, um, that's uh, old school. They don't do that yeah, today. No. <laughs> now, you know, I, I, you know, I do do it occasionally. Um, oh, we it can, do. You know, and you, um, it can sometimes backfire. You know, it's a, it's a, it's, it's an uh, odd uh, atmosphere if you do that. It can be. But um, at any rate, um, I uh, got started as a rare book dealer that way. That was pretty much it. Now, all along, uh, Lillian, your wife, mm -hmm. is supporting you in this venture, or is she apprehensive about well, it? Um, oh, no, no. She's, she's very happy that uh, I have a, a job that's making money and, and allowing me to be at home. And, you know, I think we're all attracted to the business by the making of our own hours. Yeah. And uh, being able to be with our kids when we're raising them. Yeah, that's um, very important. You know, crucial. I'm eternally grateful I got to do that. And... Uh, um, and as the kids got older, Lillian got more and more involved in the business. Yeah. So that, and certainly in the computer age, couldn't do it without her. Um, well, that was, and, that was uh, my you know, my next question to yeah. you was going to be pre-internet, post-internet. Yeah. How was your transition? Was it easy? Were you a computer person to begin with? Did you not, have to do not it like myself? Us? No, no, kicking and screaming for me. Mm. Um, why won't this machine do this? Why is it doing that? Why, you know, and Lillian saying it's not doing it. You are, you know, <laughs> you know, that kind <laughs> the of voice stuff. Of reason. That's right, exactly. You know, and she just immediately glommed on to the internal logic of these things, and and she understood it all. And uh, so, um, and then, and then we all came to grips with the the, the monumental shift. Um, with uh, and the advantages and the disadvantages of, of or yeah of, of the international of the internet selling and uh, I mean part of it makes me sad I mean um, in many regards your credentials were the experience you built up absolutely you know exposing well, yourself to these yeah. books and, and all this kind of stuff and now it doesn't mean squat in a yeah. certain sense because they don't need me to tell them how much a book is worth. They put it up on eBay, and the world will tell them. And um, and so you can anybody. I mean, literally anybody can take a wonderful book and and sell it where it used to be, you know, a function of expertise and knowing the clientele, knowing the collections, knowing the, you know the archives, who's going, where, what's the appropriate setting for this, and um, so that part's. On the other hand, um, much wonderful material has made itself. Available. available, and you wake up one morning and you've sold a five thousand dollar book to somebody in Paris while you were sleeping. While you were sleeping, you know? <laughs> <laughs> no what could be better? That's right. So, um, you know, what so that percentage of your inventory is is on the um, very small. I I chose particularly with um, a specialty like, say, American horticulture. Um, that is something that you know. I'm proud of what I know about the literature. I'm proud about. The rarities I've handled, and I've, you know, I've, and I don't want to be a price guide for that. I just, I don't want to be, you know, have somebody, you know, find a, you know, a seed catalog from an important in house in the early 19th century, and say, oh, he's got it for 1,200 bucks, or oh, you know, and then, not, it's not, um, it's not theirs to, um, to do I, that with. I, I mean, that's, I understand your, your and, point. Uh, um, so I take the books mostly that I don't care about that I know are saleable and, and put them on. But I don't bother putting on the 15th copy of the thing yeah. at the lowest price. Um, and, you know, that's, the, that's one of the other casualties is that you can take genuinely scarce, um, interesting material that, say, you had the only copy in the Northeast. And, the, and, no, and, a, and a book buyer in the Northeast wouldn't see that book in 10 years. Now I can go on and see, you know, five copies and it looks... It's all of a sudden it's robbed of any uh, mm. a scarcity, and that's it, you know it's an interesting uh, phenomenon that way. It's not um, it's not the fun it once was yes. going into a bookstore and operating on the seat of your pants when you see something. Yeah, that's right, um, and uh, um, so there's there is that whole realm of of material that's been sort of degraded by the. Um, yeah. um, what percentage of your business? is 
basically from catalogs and what percentage of your business is from visits? I, I put out catalogs now uh, intermittently, so, um, and they usually do well when I do yeah. and putting, and put them out, but largely it's by quoting and, and feeding institutions and, right. and uh, uh, private customers. Um, uh, you were talking, we were talking a little bit about the transition to computers and, and this, that, and the other thing. Um, I wonder what, if you were entering the book trade today, or if some, somebody came to you and said, Mr. Fraker, I, I want to be a bookseller, uh, give me some advice. Mm -hmm. What kind of advice might you give to a young bookseller with that kind of a, a um, if you Well, I would, I mean, it's, it's a very good question because um, I'm very pleased with the people I've been asked to sponsor, young people. Um, and generally, I'm pleased to do it because I detect a, an antiquarian sensibility. Um, and if you have that, that interest, if, you know, and that, that um, historical instincts, an ability to see a book and, and put it in a context and, and um, um, so I would say, you know, keep the day job for a while, uh, poke around, buy books, uh, put it together a first catalog that, uh, of things that you think, you know, you want to be represented by. Um, or else, if you can find employment with uh, a, a good uh, a bookstore. Apprenticeship but seems to be something uh, that young people nowadays aren't interested in doing. Yeah. Whereas I always thought that that was a good way to learn the trade. Yeah, well, I would certainly think so that would be. But again, there aren't that many places that can afford Ford, you know, um, the, I mean, certainly in, in major metropolises, um, but uh, I would say read all the catalogs you can, you know, read the bibliographies, uh, um, and find, find a niche, I mean, it doesn't have to be your exclusive specialty, but find something of a kind of books that are inexpensive, interesting, and accessible today, you know. Um, and, you know, when Garrett Scott started out, um, now there's, there's somebody, you know. Um, you consider him a young lion? Um, I, I consider him one of the mo most interesting young booksellers around. Okay. And um, he writes fascinating catalogs on 1900 to 1920, curious books. I mean, he finds the curious literature in the, and 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 it's a kind of a book that you or I, you know, would walk into a room of it, <laughs> and, you know, and not see. And yeah. he can go in and find. And I read these catalogs and say, oh boy, I wish I were a customer. I'd be buying that book and that yeah, book and that yeah. book and that book. And and he's found these things are accessible. He can poke around, and have somewhat the experience that we did with it, you know, the 19th and 18th century stuff. I mean. We're, you know, when we all started out, 18th century American books were sure. out there, you know. And they, you they were all um, over the place. I mean, and that, I mean, stuff, you know, still turns up, and I'm happy, but it's one here, one there, you know, and the, the great stuff. It's um, not like it was. Um, um, no, but I mean. But nothing the, is. I mean, that would be the, the, the boring part of the story. Now. Uh, who but else beside, beside, you know, Garrett Scott, obviously, mm -hmm. is a, a, a bright, young bookseller. Mm -hmm. Are there any other that you can think of off the top of your head, bright, young booksellers, that defied the statement, there are no young booksellers, there are no young collectors? Um, well, um, it simply isn't true. And we've seen, and we haven't seen a lot of young people in, but that's again the, the, the kind of people I'd be interested in sponsoring in ABAA. Um, and it's not like the, you know, 19 year olds coming like, you know, Jeremy, yeah. Jeremy Norman told me he started working for Howell when he was 19 and all that. You know, I, I don't see um, that kind of young. But if you're talking 30-ish. Um, I'm talking um, 35 uh, to You know, 45. people with uh, 30 years ahead of them in the trade, um, something like. Um, uh, you know, I'm drawing blanks, but, um, well, Ian Brabner. Um, yeah, but he seems to be a, an up-and-coming guy. Yeah. And this and other fellow, Kevin Johnson, from Royal yeah. Books. Yeah. Seems like he's a bright yeah. guy. No, and um, well, I uh, just moved, uh, met Bruce McKittrick's uh, young assistant, Andrew. Um, yeah. Um, lot on uh, the you, ball. Lot on the ball. Uh, understands the trade. It's just a question of, yeah. you know, sort of getting it. Um, 
there's, you know, there's this sort of, to, to me, this distressing collectibles angle to the business now. Um, you probably just saw that major collection of taxana that's coming up. Yeah, at Heritage now. Auction. At Heritage, you know, and it's a, astounding material. But when you, when you look at the way it's being marketed, it's being marketed as a collectible. And there, there's just something pictures and, and you get, all, yeah. And they wrote out twelve mo, T W E L V E M O. You know what I mean? Who you know? Nobody does that except. I mean, it, it just means they don't. There, there was just something to me that just really grated me. It's printed in this faint sans serif type that is almost impossible to read. Have <laughs> you noticed that? Yeah. Um, and these, in, in, in another age, these would have been. This would have been a major Christie's or um, absolutely. So I mean, this is. I mean, I. You must know the collection. Well, the collection but, uh, was built and, and it took three years to build it. Is that right? That fast? He built it in three years and he expects to make money selling it. <laughs> well, there you are. I mean, yeah. there again. Uh, where's the scholarship? Where's the loving accumulation of, um, you know, of, of, of building up a collection and where, th where you get to see things bounce off each other and, and, and provide a, a context for each other? You know, I mean, uh, but anyway, that's that's a whole well, other. Let me ask you an, uh, uh, another question about your inventory. You haven't talked about it, but I know that you are a buyer of American poetry. Yes, that's my own collection, which that's is also a personal collection, right? But which I see as a big chunk of inventory. Ulti <laughs> ultimately, ultimately, I am yeah. putting this together to sell. Absolutely, but, but it's I've fun done while it. You're doing. But I've been doing it for tw going on twenty-five years now. Really? Yeah, that long. And uh, it's about um, well, four thousand. Wow, four four thousand pieces, broadsides, manuscripts, pamphlets, and books. Um, and if you've heard of the poet, it's probably not in there. It's not. It's it's decidedly. I'm avoiding high spot. There's no women. Yeah. No um, poetry obscura. Yeah, poetry, and it's um, the premise um, is uh, the democratization of poetry. It became a voice of the people in, in the 19th century in a way that we don't understand, <coughs> couldn't understand today. And if you're going to understand the 19th century, or it goes from 1789 to 1900. Those are my dates. Um, uh, it's uh, it's poetry, it's social history, and social documentation. So that there are you know, many poems on women's rights, poems on Irish radicals. Poem, yeah. I mean, you've seen them. Yeah, I bought it for my. So to me, uh, it's the uh, social life and customs of our country yeah. for over a hundred years mm -hmm. is is expressed in the poetry. Of those farm women, and, exactly, and, and yep. people industri a, a cop or a yep. God only knows what, but not a professional. I, I know exactly what you. You know, if I ever write it up, I'm going to quote this letter from Thomas Campbell, the English poet, who, who wrote to somebody in America, saying, "In America, you have no great poets because everybody is a poet," and that's the whole, that's, that's the theme of this thing. Yeah. And, and they would write, you know, any social issue, any political issue, any, you know, they'd write a poem about it. And so I have. Uh, Accumulated all this stuff on that. I got started on that by Steve. I scouted uh, poetry for Steve Weissman. He was putting together a collection at one point that ended up in uh, Maryland, I think. Um, and when he decided to sell it, I said, "I can't stop it." <laughs> <laughs> so, um, just just yeah. for those who who yeah. don't know who Steve Weissman is, mm -hmm. his name of his shop is Zimini's. Yeah, and he was in New York City. And now yeah. he's in London. Yeah. So just to wind things down, yeah. Bob. Put on your thinking cap for yes. a moment and say, and you know, I'm asking you a question, where do you see us as an industry or as a trade heading? Are we going to hell in a handbasket? Are we going to be around in 20 years? Are we going to be different? Are we going to be the same? I, what, what, what's your take on what's going to happen? Well, I've always thought that the kind of books I like to sell are, are have, I mean, book selling has, has always been a function of the education of the, the, the people that buy them, so that you, when you see, you know, when a, a Edward Newton's collection reflected, you know, his love, uh, his love of Johnson, it's because Johnson was the scholar, sh scholarly craze of that time, and 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 so he gr he was imbued with that in his and and all, the whole antiquarian sensibility comes from as long if they if co universities continue to tur turn out. Historically sophisticated people engendering an antiquarian sensibility, and so that these things aren't only seen as collectibles, but these things are seen as artifacts 
of a time, and that can go for modern books too. I mean, yeah. um, I'm not um, so long as that kind of attitude is being engendered, uh, um, and I think it will. I mean, I you know I meet young kids all the time that are so on the ball uh, about history, and um, and they're amazed when they see that there are books. Um, yeah. You know, I've, you know, friends, if, you know, college age kids of acquaintances stop by the house and I, I always like to talk to them about what they're studying and what they're interested in and if it's that kind of a thing then I'll you know, start talking books to them and, and they're, they really get it so I think um, you, you see a, a future? Oh I definitely see a future I think books will become more and more exotic I, don't, I think the death of the, you know, the, the, the death of the book that they're talking about with all this computerization will only make to the right you know, sort of hip antiquarian sensibility Young person, or you know, or collector that you know, it doesn't have to be young, but um, these will seem like more, more and more exotic items. You know, a book. Um, I mean, I, that's what I think about it for in a hundred years from now. That the, the fact that there's going to be these things that you open up and you turn, you get information, could be like the most exotic um, thing. The way we look at papyrus is now, or you know, or, I mean, so I think, um, and. Um, and that's the way I, that's why I, uh, I would hope uh, that things would be. Um, I can't believe that there's going to be just uh, the death of interest mm -hmm. in books, even though they may, might not be the practical. It still is the easiest way to gather information. Yeah. You know, do I, if I want to gather information on an airplane, I don't want to scroll down a text. Um, I mean, I don't think I, people, I want to have that. It's, it's the easiest way. There it is. And um, so anyway. I, one, one last question. Yes. Uh, as time goes on, Bob, are you in this till death do you part, or do you plan to retire I, and sell your, class, your bookstore someday? No, I can't. I've, I've hardly known a bookseller that didn't keep the involvement going. I can't imagine it. Um, yeah. And, um, you know, the, the circle of friends is so intense uh, and, and, and so f satisfying and, and fundamental. And the whole associations that um, I could see, you know, just sort of maybe getting to a point where you pick, hand pick, you know, in, in a year you hand pick a catalog and send it yeah. out or that kind of a thing. But I, um, and people keep calling you up to ask you about things and, you know, and appraisals and that kind of stuff. So, no, I don't see myself as just saying, okay, I'm, Heading for Scottsdale and uh, so long, I, I don't so long, myself, suckers. I don't see myself doing the same thing. Bob, <laughs> yeah. well, thanks a lot. Yeah. Great interview. Thank you.